If you haven't noticed, we've got a bit of a uh, Grinch theme going on. <laughs> when I was a little rich, I couldn't wait every year for the television production of The Grinch Who Stole Christmas and was actually my favorite show. In fact, what I'm going to do this morning, a little bit different, um, I've got some things I'm going to give away that has everything to do with the Grinch theme, so you're going to want to have your phones out. And so I've got a nice little Grinch light here, a little Grinch lamp. I can say Clarissa broke it on the way up. No. And my love, my love for all things unique socks, I have Grinch socks. For you people who like to go to Walmart in your jammies, I've got, Chris, uh, I've got Grinch jammies. And then, thank you, dear. I have a nice lap Grinch blanket. Because I am so often accused of being a Grinch, I want to uh, biblically show you that I have very few Grinch tendencies. I can see that I have some work to do on the believability factor here. <laughs> but uh, uh, I, I, I'm going to give you a first trivia here, and here's where, how you're going to do the trivia today. I've woven in four trivia questions about the uh, movie, the How the Grinch Stole Christmas. I've never seen any of the modern ones because I don't care. Uh, and so these are going to all have to do with the, the oldest version. And in fact, the last trivia question is meant for every senior in the room. Okay, so here's how you're going to answer it. You're going to text our normal church text number, 817-813-9113, with the answer, and it'll tell me who gave me the first correct answer. And so the first trivia of the day is, what year did NBC first broadcast How the Grinch Stole Christmas? The, it'll, it'll also be up on the screen. It's 817-813-9113. Uh, the first year that NBC broadcast uh, How the Grinch Stole Christmas. The Grinch That Stole Christmas actually is a great story of redemption. It's a great story of a transformed heart. Uh, in fact, um, you, you know, if you've not seen it, the story, the original story just starts out by uh, really being introduced to the Grinch, and his heart was significantly too small. He was grumpy, this solitary creature who lived in a mountain up above a town called Whoville. His heart, it said, the, script, the, um, by, the story goes, is that his heart was two sizes too small. And for those of you that uh, can't capture the Christmas spirit, it could be that your heart is two sizes too small. Some of you are still thinking that's me. But here's what he discovered, and this is the beauty of it. He goes and, of course, he tries to steal everything that is Christmas. He steals the trees. He even, he even stole the, uh, the roast beast and what he discovered about the people of Whoville is it didn't stop him. Because what we're going to talk about today is a word called joy. And what you find is that uh, when it comes to joy, it actually cannot be stolen. Because joy is not what is around you, but what is inside of you. Joy isn't what is inside of you, not what is around you. And that's, of course, what, that's what the story is all about. He discovers that it isn't about the tree. It's not about the roast beast. It's not about the presence. It's about the joy in the whole spirit of Christmas. Well, the book of Philippians is really Paul's dossier. It's a, it's a, it's a file. It's kind of this, this collection of understanding what true joy truly is. Now, what's so amazing about this book of Philippians is that for Paul, it wasn't what was around him because as he wrote this incredible dossier on joy, he was writing it from prison. He didn't want to be in prison, but that's where he found himself. Now, you may be in a place where you don't want to be. You're, 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 you don't want to be there. And, and joy doesn't say, well, just get over it. Joy doesn't say just you're stuck with it. But joy is something inside of us that allows us to endure. It allows us to find incredible things in the midst of uh, things that are bad around us. And so Paul ultimately shows all of us, it's not what's around us, but it's what's inside of us. So here's a place I want you to connect with this morning. Because you, you may not realize this about joy. It's joy is not automatic. It's not something that just, just, just happens. But the path of joy is always under construction. 
The path of joy is always under construction. And so the psalmist said it this way. The psalmist said, you will, sh you show, you will show me the path of life. In your presence, there is fullness of joy. Yeah. See, joy is always found in him. It's found nowhere else but in him. And so he's the one that leads us into greater life in him. So it's not automatic. My tendency is to get off the path of joy rather than allow Jesus to build the path of joy right in front of me. And when you allow that to happen and you find that he's, he is, I'm leading, living his life, all of a sudden my heart, your heart, begins to grow. And of course that was a big part of the story of the Grinch is at the end of the story, his heart grew, didn't it? There's a second trivia. How big did his heart grow to? How many times did the heart grow on Christmas morning? Because here's the beautiful thing about following Jesus. As we follow him, our hearts grow. They're transformed. There's this, there's this greater capacity to find satisfaction regardless of what's going on around us. We find that we can, because of this joy, find rest in a world that is in utter turmoil. We find this immense satisfaction in the relationships that are around us. We ultimately, we find this joy, as Paul talks about later in the book of Philippians, is that there is this incredible joy that comes as we give. And so Paul, what he does is he helps us have a heart of joy. Now, I said earlier I'm accused of being the Grinch. This is how bad it is. So Josh went to California for a week, and he spent some time with one of his college roommates uh, before being married, and after being married, this college roommate's been to our house, got to spend some time. His dad is a pastor there in Southern California. And as he's there, they go outside to put up Christmas lights. And they ask Josh if he would help them put up Christmas lights. And so as they're working away, Daniel turns to Josh and says, has your dad put up Christmas lights? Josh turns to him and says, he never puts up Christmas lights. And his wife said, boy, he's a Grinch. There's this idea of what really being a Grinch is, and I'm telling you, I'm not a Grinch. So here's how I frame the rest of the sermon as we walk through different parts uh, in Philippians chapter 1. We're going to walk through, and you're going to see that a Grinch has a certain belief system. And if you want to change that belief system, and you want your heart to grow, there's something that you need to recognize. And then in the in the next part, the go piece, as we commonly talk about, we're going to talk about how to keep that heart that is growing. Because here's the thing, the enemy, will, or the enemy will always try to steal the joy that God has given you. So I want to pick it up in verse 12, chapter 1. Here's what Paul said. Paul says, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. So that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of my brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Now you're going, okay, where's the Grinch in this? Well, Paul said at the very beginning, he says, I want you to know. And there's a reason he's using these words, I want you to know. Because he lives in the, lived in the exact same world that you and I live in. That world is simply full of, of opinions and, and beliefs that your life ultimately needs to be surrounded by everything good. So here's what the Grinch, the first Grinch we're going to look at. And it's, we're just going to name him the conditional Grinch. The conditional Grinch believes circumstances will be perfect. And I'm telling you, at some level, we are all like this. We believe, ultimately, that the highest goal in life is to get your circumstances just right, where you can check off all of your bucket list items, where your retirement is that at the perfect amount, and this is one of the great challenges I have with the prosperity gospel in America, is that the prosperity gospel won't preach throughout the world. And the gospel message, in fact, will preach to everyone in the world. 
Maybe you've heard people say, God wants you happy, wealthy, and blessed. God is much more concerned with himself than he is you being happy, wealthy, and blessed. Now, that's a hard thing to amen to if, if, you're, if you're thinking that God's up there going, I'm going to get you your next goal. I'm going to get this for you. You're going you're to glorify me by you having the perfect life. Well, I'm telling you, this is being written by a guy who is in prison. And he understood that the circumstances would not dictate joy. So where does the heart growth come from? Well, the heart growth comes from perspective. If your perspective is that God is up there either to bless you or to throw a wet blanket on your life, you've got the wrong perspective. You, you end up living a conditional Grinch kind of life. You ultimately think that God, he's either going to do good things when you're doing good, and he's going to do bad things when you're doing bad. But when you understand that Paul's life was not his own, and your life is not your own, then you start having the correct perspective. Now it doesn't matter whether I have a job or I don't have a job. It doesn't matter whether I'm healthy or not healthy. It doesn't matter, and you kind of just put it any way you like. Ultimately, none of that matters if I'm more concerned with his life than I am my life. And so Paul is, he's saying throughout this portion of scripture, he said, look what Jesus is doing. I might be in jail, but Jesus is active. He's alive, even in the prison. You can see it in the empirical guards. You can see it in other people having a, an ability to go ahead and speak about the, uh, the kingdom of God. Because he understood the larger perspective of life. So much of our life, and, and the, the older you get, the, this, this is for some of you, this is kind of how you tell you're getting older. Get to be my age, okay? When you get to be my age, if, if you fall, no longer do they laugh at you. You get to be my age, if you fall, they come and think you want to know if you're okay. Right? So what you find, the older you get, is you start looking down more. You start making sure that you're not going to step on a crack or step in a hole or step off something. Because the reality is, is that, you know, my motto is no pain means no pain. So I try to avoid it wherever possible. But the problem with always looking down is that we ultimately get the wrong perspective. One of the things that we like to do during Christmas is, and we've done it not every year, but almost every year, is we drive through Interlochen. Um, I'm the guy that gets the least amount of joy out of it because I got to keep focused on the guy in front of me while everybody else is looking around. Proper perspective is lifting your chin, looking around, and recognizing that God is active in your current circumstance. Amen. And so what do you do? Well, ultimately, once you start to get that perspective, you ultimately start being a little bit like the dog that was in the Grinch and how he stole Christmas. The funny thing about that dog is he's probably got the worst owner on the planet and that dog is bouncing around everywhere, loving life. You know, he's got to pull that big old sleigh. But man, as soon as the opportunity rises and it's going downhill, where does the Grinch find him? On the back, enjoying the ride. He has a perspective of life of a dog. Dogs typically are, a dog aren't going to have a, a ho-hum, feel bad kind of thing. You can, you can kick them one day and they'll lick you the next day. Because they have a dog perspective. But if you're always living life looking down, you're going to have an earthly perspective. But when you have a heavenly perspective, it doesn't mean that you don't have some hard times. But the whole book of Psalms is about life being hard, but God is good. Amen. So our perspective becomes much different. Now we're not just living this life for ourselves. Now we are living his life. And so the practice is simply you start practicing talking about what God is doing. One of the things that really saddens me is how few Christians actually talk about God's activity. Now, I like talking sports as much as the next guy or whatever other people like to talk about, but I love talking about what God is doing. Because when you have a heavenly perspective, when you understand that this life is not bound up to 60, 70, 80, 90, or 100 years, all of a sudden you start approaching it differently. You begin to talk about the lives that God is having you influence. 
You begin to let other people know what a heavenly or kingdom perspective is in any given area. So I'm going to give you another trivia. What was the dog's name in the show? I got to pause because I'm going to read scripture next. I don't want any of you to miss that part. Paul goes on and he says, Some indeed, indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. Okay, now where is the Grinch in this? Well, understand Paul's perspective here. We look back and we think, boy, that Paul was a pretty good guy. But when Paul was on the earth, there were people who liked Paul, and there were people who were against Paul. All right, now survey your own life. Who is in your life that is for you, and who is in your life that is against you? See, there, there is something called the analytical Grinch. The analytical Grinch ultimately compares themselves with other people. Now, I know I'm not preaching to anybody in the room. This is for everybody online because everybody that's here does not compare themselves with other people. They don't get on Facebook and go, that person seems to be having all the fun. They don't get on, you know, Instagram and go on, why do they get to eat at all the good restaurants? You, you don't do that kind of stuff. I get that. But here's what they did with Paul. They looked at Paul's circumstance and they stepped on Paul in order to lift themselves. And I guarantee you, if you live long enough, you're going to have people who do that in your life. They're going to step on you in order to lift themselves up higher. Why do they do that? Because they're an analytical Grinch. They're comparing themselves with other people. I get asked all the time, do you listen to this preacher? Do you listen to that preacher? And I, I'm like, nah, I don't. Because I don't want to echo their words. And to be quite honestly, I, don't, I already got the bad hair. I don't want to be like them in any other way either. I just always felt like that's a prerequisite for pastoring is just to have something weird with your hair. But the reality is, is that when you compare yourself with other people, you are absolutely and positively miserable. Why? Because you always recognize the strengths and the blessings of other people and you yourself will feel inadequate and you will feel and live with very low self-esteem. You look at other people's accomplishments and wonder why you don't have those accomplishments. Certainly, Paul was there in jail at some point and thought, boy, I think I could do a whole lot more if I was not in here. We know that in, of course, the modern day understanding of science and the brain, which, by the way, the brain is just another part of your flesh, uh, that when people live this analytical Grinch lifestyle, they have mental health problems. They say that in the 1960s, the average age of a person who had mental health problems was 29. Today, it's 14. Because there's so many more, there's so many more uh, varying ways that people compare themselves with others. Listen, I, I was not immune to this. When I was a little rich, I'm, I'm saying I was seven or eight years old. We lived in Richland, Washington, and we went over to the school that was having a bike competition. And they had all these different courses that you would ride to, to compete. And um, I made it to the final round. My parents were never really interested in that kind of stuff. They never went to any of that stuff when I was growing up. But I, I you know, I was there. my older brother and sister went, and I made it to the final competition, and none of them made it to the final competition, and everybody went home. And I did the, the last competition, and I came in third place. And I went home, and because, because already at a young age, I had already been introduced to sin and this, this idea that I've got to compare myself with others, even though there were only two people better than me, I went home and thought I could sell the lie that they ran out of blue ribbons. So I got the white one. Okay, I've recovered. But those are the kinds of things that we do. We can't live with who we are because we're comparing ourselves with other people. And so Paul understood that for him, he was put there for the defense of the gospel. Why would he say that? That's not a good place to defend the gospel. It wouldn't seem like it. But if you want your heart to grow, then it has everything to do with relationship. And get this now. This isn't about knowing who you are. The Bible is not about self-discovery. 
It's not figuring out who I am. It's discovering who I am is. Let me say that again. It's about discovering who the great I am is. If you will spend as much time getting to know him rather than getting to know yourself, you'll spend a whole lot less time comparing. Because you'll, you'll begin to understand how great and awesome and powerful this great God is. You'll begin to recognize his strengths, his accomplishments, his power, his ability, his joys, his di disappointments. And when you do that, then you'll start hearing his words where he tells you that you are greatly loved. Well, let me ask you a question. You don't have to answer it. It's not, certainly not a trivia question. But when's the last time you heard the God of heaven affirm you? I guarantee you most people would say, I hear God telling me what I am not, rather than patting me on the back going, good job. Because what happens early on is religious comparison. And we have man marks. And because we've never really got to know him, we don't hear his words of affirmation. We don't hear his words of saying, wow, you went a week this time. Good job. I'm proud of you. I I'm working in you. My strength's still there. My power to transform you is still, still a reality. And so when you begin to grow in this, this relationship piece, then here's what happens. How do, you, how do you end up keeping a healthy heart here? Well, it has everything to do with rest. A person who is comparing themselves with others, they don't find a place of rest because they're always trying to please someone. But the God that I know, since I've spent time with the great I am, I know that he is absolutely perfect. I know that he is the one who gave himself. And if the one who's absolutely perfect and absolutely perfect in giving is okay with me, I don't have to worry what about other people think of me, regardless of my circumstances, regardless whether I'm rich or poor, regardless of whether I've eaten or I have not. Because now I find this place of perfect rest. Goes on in he, verse 18, he says this, what then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed. And in that, I rejoice. Yes, and I will rejoice. For I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will, re will turn out for my deliverance. Now, this Grinch that we're going to talk about actually is opposite of what Paul is doing here. This is the passive Grinch. The passive Grinch ultimately concedes to other people's plan for their life. That's what the, Grinch, the passive Grinch does. They, they're, because, and, it, and it comes real close to the analytical Grinch, but they allow what other people have intended for their life to control them, and so they just sit and do nothing rather than actually doing something about the circumstances. See, what Paul, you, what you see in this scripture is Paul was not happy about being in prison. He doesn't get up in the morning and go, yes, one more day of chains. Yes, one more day of prison food. I'm happy and blessed. He doesn't do that. He says, I, I rejoice because I know you're praying for me. I want out of here. He wasn't passive. He didn't say, well, this is just where God has me. Oh, I'm going to live in hell until I get to heaven. He's not doing that. But that's what a passive Grinch does. They think, that, they think that just because their circumstances have them crowded in, that God has got something out for them. But Paul says, no, pray for me. And he says, I rejoice because I know that you've prayed, and God is going to deliver me from this. So what's the heart growth in this? Well, the heart growth is simply confidence. Not confidence that we can get it figured out. It's confidence in the one we've gotten to know. It's confidence in Jesus Christ. Okay, can I, can I mess with some of your theology here just real quick? Because, you know, this is what keeps you as a passive Grinch. Here's what you believe. Jesus has my best interest at heart. 
He doesn't. He's got his own best interest at heart. And his best interest is best for you and I. Now, I notice I, need, I got a couple nods, one amen. Because, because when you think that Jesus, your, your, heart, your circumstances, Jesus' best heart, you miss the big perspective. You can never have confidence in that because whenever I think, well, God's going to get me well taken care of, things seem to go further south. They don't seem to get better. But when I understand that Jesus is going to glorify himself and he's going to glorify himself through me because my life is not my own, it is his life, then it doesn't matter the circumstance and I can say, Jesus, if I have to endure this season of life, I will do it for you. And I'm going to find joy in it. But think about it from Paul's perspective. He wanted out of there. But do you realize that at least of what we know of, four of the letters in the New Testament were written while he was in prison. I got to think that God had to slow Paul down a little bit. Paul would have gone from city, proclaim the gospel, get beat up, about killed, maybe killed and raised again, go to the next city, have it done again. He'd have done that all the way to the end. But I think God said, no, no, I'm going to glorify myself through you by slowing you down, putting you in prison, and I'm going to have you write some things that I can use for generations. And so our confidence when it's in Jesus, it's not that we become apathetic. We pray for circumstances to change, but we know that since our life is not our own, Lord, okay, if you think you look best, me being in prison, if you think, and some of you need to tell this to the Lord, if you think you look best by me still being sick, I'm okay with that. If, Jesus, you look best by me going bankrupt, I'm good with that. Boy, isn't this a good Christmas message? Don't you just like that? <laughs> See, what you're finding out is that, you know, the Grinch isn't necessarily up here. The Grinch is in our own little hearts. But when you have confidence in Jesus that his name will be glorified, that, that his life will be shown in every circumstance, then you can rejoice. But how do you keep it that way? Well, I think this is where the confiding comes in. This is all Paul is doing. He's, he's just going, look, pray. There's nothing wrong with asking people around you to pray. Pray that the circumstance changes. I don't know how many hospital visits I've, I've prayed with people, and, I, and ultimately, I don't really know how God's going to glorify himself in this situation. And I say, Lord, there's no better place to be than in your hands, because I have confidence in you. I'm glad that we have doctors. I'm glad that we have medicine, but my confidence ultimately is in Jesus Christ. So every time that you ask someone to pray, it's okay that you're stating, I don't like my circumstance. But also confide that it's Jesus' heart that needs to be shown here. In your worst relational challenge, it's Jesus' heart that needs to be shown. It's Jesus' heart when you're fired from your job that needs to be shown. And so we declare our confidence in Jesus. Because we want Jesus to be known in and through us. All right. Before I go to the last one, I'll give you one more. This is the last trivia question. This is for you, you, younger people. If you, even, you have to Google this in order to find it, so I'll know you were Googling during the sermon if you answer this. Who is the narrator of the original TV special? He hadn't been alive for a while. All right, let's look at the last Grinch. Paul said in verse 21, he said, For to me, to live is Christ... And to die is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. Yet which I shall uh, shall I choose? Excuse me. Yet which I shall choose, I cannot tell. I am hard pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. The last Grinch. is the narcissistic Grinch. The narcissistic Grinch just simply has priorities really confused. Paul's struggling with his wants, with God's wants. Certainly he would have much rather just died than continued in prison. 
But he didn't have confused priorities. He understood that ultimately his life was Jesus' life. And that his life wasn't being lived for the here and now, but the not yet. And so everything that he did in this life was an investment for the next. He understood, get this, because this is counter everything American, his life wasn't even in his own control. He didn't have confused priorities. And the reason we have confused priorities is that our hearts are not humbled. Now, here's what we're not going to do today. If, you, if you're the narcissistic Grinch, we are not going to pray that God humbles your heart because God doesn't do that. It's our job to humble ourselves. He'll humiliate us. And in the humiliation, his objective is for us to humble ourselves. You ever thought why in the book of Revelation, it says that, you know, here you have these scorpions that are stinging people, they're out dying, and, and they don't turn to God, they get more mad. God is humiliating them in the most alien way possible, and they still won't turn to God. COVID did not cause people to turn to him as a whole. The whole world was humiliated by something they couldn't see, and the world didn't turn to God. Because they were unwilling to humble themselves. Romans says that they enjoyed the darkness rather than light. I guess that would be John. But when we, but when we say, I'm not going to be the narcissistic Grinch. I'm not going to have confused priorities. I'm going to recognize that my life isn't my own. I humble myself before you, Lord. And then the result of that is you live a life where you are honoring other people. You're putting God first, others second, and yourself last. And here's what happens in all these cases. Our heart continues to grow. We're going to have a board lunch after service today, and I was writing uh, each one of the, the board's things that I had on my heart for each individual member and how the Lord was wanting me to encourage them and, and just reflecting in my heart. And I got done and looked at my handwriting, threw it away. I, I mean, I threw like 10 cards away because I have bad handwriting and I just typed it. But here's the thing. When you recognize the preciousness in those that are leading you, it doesn't do anything but humble you and it makes you want to honor them. But when you have confused priorities, you'll actually do quite the opposite. So, how has the path of joy been built in 2022? Are you going to allow the path of joy to be built day by day, circumstance by circumstance, so that no longer it's what's on the outside that controls you? but it's what's on the inside that controls you. Because perspectives, they need to be practiced. Relationships need to be rested in. Confidence needs to confide. And humility will always honor. And so, Lord, thank you that, Lord, that ultimately, Lord, whether we put Christmas lights up or not, whether we we sing Christmas carols around the house, whether we, we watch the Hallmark Channel. That's not what makes us a Grinch. Uh, Lord, ultimately what makes us a Grinch is believing that circumstances can ultimately bring us joy. And Lord, we desire to live our life in your life. Lord, we want to give ourselves completely to you this Christmas season so that we, Lord, can capture the spirit of joy. And Lord, while there's certainly a little bit of Grinch in each and every one of us, would you help us to grow? Would you cause our hearts to, to grow this Christmas season? So that, Lord, we might enter 2023 with a path of joy that is continually being built. In Jesus' name. If you agree with that at any point, say amen. Let's stand together. <laughs>